Hi, welcome back to the workshop. You know what, the Range Rover's been a bit fighty, so I thought I'd give myself a change of scenery. Now this is my mate Chris's Alvis TD21 from 1962. Now, Alvis are a British car manufacturer and they were based in Coventry from between about 1919 and 1967 and they were world renowned for their luxury performance vehicles. And the TD21 is definitely one of those and it was really favoured by a certain kind of dashing gentleman with daring do. The kind of guys like Prince Philip, God rest his soul, he actually had two TD21s and both of them were customised to have taller windscreens and a higher roof line so he had a bit more headroom. Then he had people like the World War II ace Douglas Bader, he had all kinds of Alvis and all kinds of models and different versions of them. And then we come to the original owner of this particular car. Now his name was Rear Admiral Sir Morgan Giles. Now he was another true hero of the era. During World War II, he was a torpedo specialist. He actually managed to survive three plane crashes. He even jumped into the sea to push a mine or swim a mine away from his ship to keep everybody safe. And he was the last commander of HMS Belfast. You get the kind of idea of the sort of people who would own one of these vehicles. Now you speed through a number of other owners and eventually my mate Chris found it in Germany and brought it back home to the UK. Now the reason it's here it's because he's got a really great, fun idea of what we could do with the car. But he also happened to mention a rather long list of things that could also do with being sorted. And so I thought I'd ease myself into this project with the very first simple thing. There's a problem with the light switch. Now, Chris was ragging this around Silverstone Race Circuit for the Pomeroy Trophy, which is a fantastically quirky event. And at the end of a wonderful day's racing, he went to go home, turned on the light switch, and then the lights just cut out immediately and he couldn't actually get anything to happen that evening. So he had to stay the night and go home in daylight the next day. Obviously not ideal. So the first thing I want to do to have a look at this problem is see if I can actually recreate it. Basically there seems to be a bit of an issue and it's intermittent for one thing. So I'm just going to try and work out exactly what the problem is. The interesting thing about the switch is it's sort of a little bit novel. I guess maybe it was a, an interesting idea back in the day. You basically pull it out and that gives you your side lights. You then rotate it slightly to the right or clockwise and then put it out a bit more and that gives you your dip beam, which seems to be working fine. If I just wiggle the switch around, you can see the lights sort of struggling a tiny bit. Oh, I barely touched that and now it's just gone off. <laughs> and then back on again and then off. That's fantastic. So clearly it's definitely an intermittent problem and it seems to be no sense. I mean, I think what's happening is probably there's a bit of corrosion on the switch itself and maybe over time it's just got a little bit worse. I mean, perhaps we could take it apart and clean it. I'll just feel the wiring as well and see what's going on there behind. I can just get my fingers to it. It's warm. That's not good. It means there's obviously some resistance going on, so probably we're not getting all the energy to the lights. Oh, and they've just gone off again. So that, so there's clearly something wrong with the wiring, but also perhaps the switch itself. So maybe it's just corroded over time and whatever. So I think probably the clever thing to do is to use the replacement switch that Chris has bought. What I need to work out now is how to get it out of the dash. Now to give me a helping hand when it comes to trying to work out how to get this switch out of the dashboard, I'm just going to look at the new one because chances are there'll be a few clues. Now you can see well, that's obviously where all our three wires are going to go and they're just very simple old sort of screw terminals and then you've got this nut on the front which would actually then hold the switch in place on the dashboard so I guess the dash is going to go into here. Problem we've got here is actually we've got this walnut fascia so I'm kind of hoping we don't have to take that off but of course there's also a risk this might just drop down as I'm trying to pull it out but the first thing I need to do is get that knob off and you can see there's a little tiny little button here and that's sprung loaded, which is quite clever. So theoretically, I should be able to operate that from the outside here. So just get a little pick or something and then basically sort of push that down. That should be able to then pull the knob off. So I'll give that a go. So I can't see anything, I'll just pull it out. Okay, so with the lights full on, so there's a little dimple just here on the side of the switch. So if I now push that down like so, <laughs> there we go. So. That's our little Bakelite knob off. 
In fact, you can actually see on the back there, it's actually got like a little sort of tapered bit. So you don't even have to push the button back to push the switch. It's just very clever. So it's almost like a little keyway. So it's very nice. Properly engineered. <laughs> so now the problem is, I can actually see the switch, but I can't see how it's held in. I'm hoping maybe, maybe they've actually just kind of cut the thread into perhaps the metal or the wood of the back of the dashboard. But the only way I'm really going to find that out is by unwinding it. Of course, then I've got a problem with the wires themselves twisting up. So this could get interesting. I might have to be getting upside down to see what's going on, but I'll see if I can just do it by touch to start with. So I can feel, so there's like a reset for the dashboard. There's all kinds of stuff under here. I can feel the one, oh, it's tight, it's tight. I can feel the three sort of pins here, these little brass pins on the top there. So I'm just wondering if I can apply it. Oh yeah, well, it's sort of wiggling. I have a horrible feeling I might have to take off all of this dashboard. But on the other hand, as long as I know where the buttons are, I can take them all off, make sure I don't mix them all up. And I'm presuming they're all going to have the same sort of mechanism to open them. But I think a really little clever tactic right now might be just to disconnect the battery because if I'm going to start fiddling with those wires, I don't want to cause a short behind the deck, cause a fire and destroy the whole car. That'd be very bad. So I'll do that next. Now, whenever you disconnect the battery before you work on a car, you always want to take off the earth strap first, and that minimizes the risk of actually shorting out the other terminal against the bodywork. But in this car, because it's so old, it's actually a positive earth rather than a negative earth. And that means I need to disconnect the earth off the positive terminal. Now you can double check that. You can see this cable here is actually attached to the bulkhead and then further down attached to the engine. So obviously that's why you know it is the earth. Now I'm gonna to have to disconnect this side rather than that side. Right, you know what, thinking about it, there's only three of the four screws holding the walnut dash on. So I'm just gonna just start to undo those and just see kind of what is revealed. Cause I don't think they'd go to the trouble of making it too hard to hold this on because all the little knobs seem to go through the walnut. So what I'm wondering is I might be able to get away with only removing a couple of them and if I can kind of just get up underneath, I might be able to undo the nut that holds the switch in place without removing everything. So let's have a little look. All right, got a little bit of flexibility here. The radio knobs are in the way, so just remove those like so. Make sure I know roughly where they are. There you go. So actually, that's pretty good. We're getting a bit of movement. Now I've got the heater control knobs here. And they've got the same little hole in the top there. But interesting, there's also a hole on the other side. So I might need a bit of juggling here. Let's have a look. So I'm not sure if I had to do both at the same time. Perhaps it's like trying to pick a lock. I think, I'm not sure. I can't feel anything on that side. I'll try the other side. So I'm not sure whether they've just made it so the knobs can go on either way or whether there's two releases. Ah, there we go, something's, something's happened, that's good. There we are, fantastic. So there is actually the same sort of mechanism with the springs underneath. So just in case of getting that around the right way. So make sure that I don't mix up the uh, knobs there. There we go, there's that one, fantastic. So now let's just Oh, well, I might get away with this actually. So I can see, brilliant, I can see the nut. So the nut is actually on the front of the steel part of the dashboard, which of course is underneath the wood. So I can see that. Now the question is, I'm hoping if I use these circlet pliers, perhaps I might be able to just get onto, so basically you've got the little tabs sort of just here either side. And what I'm hoping is I might be able to use the circlet pliers just to put sort of them either side of this nut and then actually find a way of undoing it that way. And then maybe once it's finger loose, 
that will be fine. So let's have a go. So just try and get circlip pliers just underneath here and then hang on. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Oh, it's going. Right, so that's now off, which is great. I'm just going to try and get the nut off without losing it. I can just push that through. I should be able to grab it so you can see the wires are kind of pushing it back in. Oh, there you go. Brilliant. And now I should be able to get to it from the other side. I'm going to have to lie down. There we go. At least the seats are comfortable, which is nice. Yep, definitely going to have to come further around. Right, so let's rummage around the back here and see if I can feel something. Ah, okay, so I've now got the switch. It's loose, which is good. Oh, just popped a bob. Just gonna remove that, I think, the reset for the odometer. Give us a bit more room. Nearly there. Oh, the oil pressure conduit. Right, now there we go. So we've now got our switch. And I can see the three terminals on the rear of it, which is great. The wires are kind of stuffed in, and of course, when I could feel it being really warm, it's probably because there's a little bit of resistance where the connection isn't so great. And what, to make sure I don't get it all wired incorrectly, what I'm going to do is do one at a time and swap it over to the new switch. But I think what I might also do is undo this and have a double check. It looks to me like the wires could do with a better connection to try and, you know, sort out that resistance issue if you like so just undo that pop that out yeah so the wiring has seen better days and so the problem is when that little screw terminal kind of clamps down on that if it hasn't got a really great connection then that in resistance increases and therefore a bit of heat starts to get generated so if i just put a little crimp ferrule on the end of that, like a, it's like a boot lace sort of ferrule that you have on a, on a boot lace. Um, and what's going to happen then is it's going to give a much better contact area for the screw to kind of bite down on. So that should give us a much better connection, which will get rid of the problem of the heat at the back. And then the new switch should make the whole thing work beautifully. So that'll be my next problem, I think. Well, hopefully this will be a bit easier to see on the bench. Now, these are little bootlace ferrules. You can see you've got effectively a little metal tube on one end. And in this particular case, it's not always the case, but you've also got a little bit of insulation, a little bit of sort of a sleeve on the other. Now, if I compare that to our sort of raw wire, you can see it's nicely twisted, but as soon as you try to wind in sort of a nut, or a run, as soon as you try to wind in a bolt for a terminal, of course, those wires are gonna splay out. Whereas if we just pop ferrule over the end you can see now it's going to actually crush down on the tube that's going to get a much better connection now there are a couple of ways you can actually do the crimping we'll go on here this is a, a c-shaped crimp so just pop that in there like so and then i'll just crush that down and you can see then you've got this sort of dimple on that side so that's one way of doing it alternative way this particular thing is i've got now a square shape crimp and you see it's quite a clever little device it actually just makes that square or that diamond into a much smaller square so I just pop that into the machine and then just crush that down so you can see then you've got a square whereas at that end you've got a C or a U as it happens for no particular reason I'll use one of these Right, well actually, that blue wire there, it's not looking very good. It's lost a lot of its strands. So I think even though we haven't really got much length there, I'm just gonna trim that off and I'll add the ferrule. And then, in fact, I'm gonna just trim it first and see what we've ended up with. Because really, we wanna make sure we've got a really good connection. <laughs> it's quite fiddly. Sure the wires are nice and twisted and I'm hoping one of these little bootlace ferrules will fit. Right, so now, so you can see already that that's going to do a much better job of connecting. Now I have to crimp it in position, so 
they've got this kind of strange sort of it's like a pair of pliers that goes just down into a square. Pretty sure that's okay, but I'm just gonna do one more just to be sure. Okay, so now so what I want to do is put that into the new switch. So again, make sure the orientation is the same. So I've got sort of the slot which actually guides the switch through, it's in the right position. So that's this one here. Oh. I'm guessing they did all this <laughs> while the dashboard perhaps wasn't even in the car. That's much better. So now you see we're going to get a much, much better contact on that, which is good. So now I'll do the one around the back, which looks quite difficult to get to. So the brown wire. So, so if I get those in the same direction, so I would say that was this one here. Let's have a look at that. That's actually slightly better. But again, I'll just twist the end and make sure I can get the ferrule on there as well. Slightly bigger, it's quite a thick wire. Okay. So wire that into place and then crimp it down. Now what I might do, I'm just gonna trim just trim the end off just a little bit because it's quite long. So just get some pliers and just make that slightly less, oh, slightly more rounded if you like, so we can get it in. So find the right terminal. In fact, I think what we might do is just put it in from the inside because now it's protected, that's all good, but it just means that all the wires will go in the right direction, which would be nice. So then there's the last one, which is actually two wires in one. Okay. So the old switch is now out, which is nice, and then just again try and wind these together. So I'm just going to Squish the end of the sleeve there just a little bit, just so it fits over both wires. Okay. So hopefully we can now crimp this. Looking good. So again, I might just trim off the end just a little bit, just give us themselves some more space. And again, just make it round just to be sure. And undo the final terminal. Yes. 
Got enough room to come in from this side, so let's do that. And you can feel it's a much better contact. So now, that switch should work a treat. What I've got to do now is get it back into the back of the dash. So I'm just going to take the nut off, because of course that's quite important. So here we go, let's try and thread it back through. the hole which is probably quite tricky it seems. I can't actually see it so again I'm mostly just using touch. Now it's in the hole, it's got to get the orientation right, so I can just wind it around without chewing up the wires. Because there is a little flat on the, you can sort of see on there, there's a, little, there's a little flat on that threaded part, and of course that's what actually kind of locates it in the dashboard, stops it from spinning around, so I've got to make sure that I get that through the hole. It looks like I've managed that, which is good. Let me just put that on before I lose the switch again. Well, it's a simple job, but didn't say it was going to be easy. Try not to make sure I don't cross thread it. There we go. Right, so now I need to tighten it up, but that's in the right place. I'll just put that bowl back into the oil gauge. That's great, and make sure that our trip, our odometer trip is, or reset is in place. So now, <laughs> we're good. I've just got to tighten that up, put the dashboard back together. Right, so now I can reconnect the battery and give it a whirl. Right, so battery reconnected. I'll now try the switch again. Okay, here we go. So, side lights, brilliant. Look at that. No hesitation, no wobbling, which is all good. So it seems our new switch has now solved this problem, which is great. But now I'm at the front of the car, I noticed something else to sort out, which of course is that side light's looking a little bit dim and all that is a job for another day. Right, time for a well-earned cup of tea. Now, over the last few weeks, it's been really good fun going through all of your questions and comments, so please do keep them coming. Now, one of the things that does keep coming up is all about subtitles. Our first episode did have subtitles, the second two, not so much just yet. So we are gonna sort that out. We are gonna have subtitles all the time so you can actually understand what I'm saying anywhere in the world. And hopefully some of you might be able to help us out with those translations, so do get in touch if you can. Now, while I just finish off this cup of tea, please enjoy the next section of the ice cream van story. So I'd accepted the challenge of attempting to set the Guinness World Record for the world's fastest electric ice cream van. And of course that meant building the world's first all electric ice cream van. Whitby Morrison had put a body onto a brand new Sprinter chassis that I'd got from Mercedes. And I immediately set to trying to remove a perfectly good diesel engine that only had 14 miles on the clock.
Well, at last, the engine is out of our ice cream van, so that can now go into storage or whatever, but I've been thinking about the gearbox. I think it might be useful to hang on to this. I have no idea how long the track is while I'll be doing the record. If it's two miles long, then the electric motor will easily be able to get up to speed in time. But if it's much shorter, I may need to use the gears to accelerate more quickly. So therefore, I think we'll hang on to that, which means I need to separate it from the engine. So then I had to find an electric motor. Now, right now, brand new electric powertrains are still pretty expensive. So I've opted for second hand for our little world record attempt. Now, this little chap right here can produce 80 kilowatts of power or 107 brake horsepower and 254 newton meters of torque or 187 pounds feet. Now, on paper, that means it's actually underpowered and undertorqued, if you like, compared to the 314 Sprinter, which can produce 105 kilowatts and 330 newton meters of torque. Now, the thing is that 330 newton meters of torque actually comes at about 1200 RPM, whereas this little chap can actually manage it from zero revs. So that means you're going to get more power, more acceleration earlier on. So I think, on balance, this should be more than enough to get us into the record books. Now, I could grab a ruler and my very nearly gauge or vernier caliper and actually start measuring all the various points around both bodies, or I could actually 3D scan both of them and put them straight into my computer. But to that end, I'll be using a Creoform HandyScan 700. Now, what this clever machine does is it actually uses lasers to scan the surface of any 3D object and then puts that information straight into the computer so I can process it later. And it takes way more measurements than I can be bothered to do, which is rather handy. So the first thing I need to do with this is actually calibrate it. So I have a special little calibration plate. And you can see there's all these little tiny targets and they're in very precise positions across the whole of this surface. And the software is just showing me here what I need to do. So I turn it on. Okay, right, so I've got the little target in the center. I've got to stay there. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, that actually controls my up and down. If you like, on the top, you can see that shows me where I am in that orientation. And then the last one on the right-hand side is actually how far away I am from the target. So my idea is to try and get the dot in the center and then try and bring the control, just following those requests, shall we say. And now it wants me to go slightly over that side and over to that side, and then that way. So it's a little bit hard to get used to, but you get there. There we go, so now it's happy with the scan, which is brilliant. So the next phase is just to make sure that the aperture is correct. So it's a bit like a camera, how much light it's gonna get in. So if I now put the scanner on again, you can see you've got all these sort of yellow and gray edges on the top there, these yellow lines. Now, if I actually open the aperture a bit more, you can see there's some red bits start to form, and that's where it's kind of overexposing. So if I just back that off again, and I can adjust this any time I'm going through the process, but that now gives me just the right amount of exposure, and I can change that as I'm going, just in case I can't get into a dark, shadowy corner. And then we are ready to scan. But before I can do that, I need to put some of these targets all over the items I'm going to be scanning. And so you just literally have these little sticky tabs, and just pop them on all over the place. It actually then sees these dots. It knows exactly how thick they are. So you can't just use any old reflective circle. And then it takes that away from the thing so that it leaves the surface unimpinged, if you like, by these little targets. So when you actually do the scan, they won't be there anymore. As long as I don't move the dots, I can actually then come back and actually just add a few in different corners and move around, but I can actually then manipulate the whole piece in any orientation. It doesn't matter because the Creoform is actually using these dots to know exactly where it is. So it's actually a very clever bit of gear. And you can actually add dots as you're going as well. And the idea is to do it randomly. <laughs> so it'd be quite easy if I don't pay enough attention. It's amazing how hard it is actually to do things in a random way. See if that's enough to be getting on with. So here we go, let's start scanning. 
So we pop it on and you can see straight away there's a load of lasers coming out and there's lots of them. There's kind of this big crisscross and you can see on the screen straight away there's those are little dots forming. And these are the targets, so it now knows where those targets are. And as you can see, I'm just basically just gently sort of painting our 3D sculpture with this laser light. And it's just taking that data and actually transporting it straight into the screen. So it's actually already building up quite a nice shape. Now, as he uses these targets, rather like it was triangulation, it's rather like a mobile phone and GPS. So that's how the Korea Formula knows exactly where it is in space. And then with each of the lasers, you can imagine it's a bit like sonar, like a dolphin or a submarine might use, or if you're even trying to find fish. Basically, you fire down this, either a sound in the case of sonar, with this, you fire the laser, and it measures the time or the distance that it comes back. Because it's got so many lasers, that makes it super accurate, and it can kind of cross-check what it's actually doing. And in this way, then, you end up with all these points in space in relation to where the Korea form is, so then it knows exactly where they are in the world, which is quite an amazing thing. But also, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm not really paying enough attention to, there's a little bar with colours and a little white line. Now, I've also got a light on the back here, so when it's green, I'm in the right distance from my subject. And you can see if I go too far away, it goes into like a blue colour. If I go really close, it goes red. So the trick is, obviously, to keep it somewhere in the middle. And you can obviously change the orientation at any time as well. It just helps it find that information. So I can also now just to get a slightly better idea of that detail and zoom in. You can see, look at those little bulges on the inside of the gearbox. That's part of its strength thing, but there's lovely sort of sharp images of a nice soft, soft feature. I don't even need that information, but it's just nice to have it on there. What I'm actually looking for is just the detail around the outside, so where those holes are. And of course, all of that in relation to the first motion shaft, that shaft sticking out of the gearbox there. So I'm just going to make sure I've got a good image of that, because that is what everything else is going to ride upon. I need to make sure that that is going to be central and aligned with the one off the motor. And if I really was feeling a bit tarty, I could scan the whole gearbox and have a model of that, so I could then use it in another design at a later time. I could even pop it onto a 3D printer if it was big enough and had enough time to wait. I could actually print out a 3D printed version in plastic, in metal, in glass, even in sand. But we'll get to that another time. Now, all I really need from this scan is the detail about the first motion shaft coming out of the gearbox and also, of course, all the holes that go around the edge of the bell housing. And I've got a pretty nice image there, so I think the gearbox is done. So all I have to do now is the electric motor. Now, back in the day when this technology was first invented, you can imagine all the little points that the lasers find make up a massive cloud of all these little dots, like millions and millions of little dots. And that made it quite difficult to process for a computer. It needed a huge amount of processing power to try and make that into an image you could use. But what makes this machine so clever is it takes all those dots and actually makes them in little facets, little triangles, rather like you'd have on an image in a computer game for a 3D model there. And the idea is, of course, that means it's much lighter on data, so it's quicker and easier to handle and to manipulate. Right, well, I'm now pretty happy. I've got a great image of our electric motor now in our VX element. So what I need to do is save that, ready to export out into SolidWorks, and then I can then start processing that with the next stage. Having digitized the mating faces of the main components, I was getting a reasonable idea of how I might connect them together. But what I needed to do now was work out how to connect the shafts inside. And that is a job for another time. See you next week. <laughs>